Mm-hmm. Uh, feel free to ask your questions following our speaker's presentation. My pleasure today to welcome uh, Tom Ju. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to make sure, can the Zoom people hear me? The people on Zoom? I hope, so. hope so. Yes, oh, yes. we can. Great. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mikhail, for the nice introduction and for the invitation. So it's so great to be here again. I think I was here two years ago in the, exactly in the same room and talking about a different topic. But today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some, some of my recent work, uh, still mainly during my postdocs at UC Berkeley. And we're, we're trying to use actually a dipolar spin ensemble in Diamond to study emergent hydrodynamics. Okay, so by the way, feel free to stop me if you have any questions during the during this uh, presentations. So, oops, shoot, why it doesn't work? Uh, maybe, let me see, sorry, give me one. Oh, now it works, great, so good. So it turns out in the past decade has witnessed like a tremendous advances in creating those like what we call the optical quantum spin defects in solids. And this broad, very broad landscape has ranging from like creating, for example, naturally occurring defects in diamond or silicon carbide. And also very recently starting to be like search for spin qubits, for example, in rare earth doped oxides, and also recently in some 2D Van Vals uh, materials. And this type of defect has been widely used as a powerful tool to, for, for example, for quantum communication, quantum sensing, and simulation and computation. In this talk, I will focus on, mainly focus on this type of like nitrogen vacancy center in Steinman and trying to, so my group are, in the past, I'm interested in exploring this for quantum sensing and also quantum simulation and computation or study many body dynamics. And in this talk, I will mainly focus on this part and we're trying to use them for some, to study the, the, the quantum dynamics. Okay, so let me first give a very, very brief introduction to NV centers as not too many people are actually getting uh, familiar with this. So in the diamond tetrahedral structures, if you have two uh, uh, nitrogen and a vacancy uh, defects actually replacing the two Johnson carbon atoms, then this forms what we call the nitrogen vacancy centers. And this MV center actually lives in the large band gap of this diamond. And the ground state of this MV center actually consists of a spin one degree of freedom where plus one minus one states are degenerate and sits around 2.87 gigahertz above the zero state. So note that although there is a zero field splitting, but typically this zero, uh, this 2.87 gigahertz is actually compared, for example, with the thermal excitation energy at room temperature or even at four Kelvin liquid temperature. This energy is way smaller than the thermal energy. So therefore at thermal equilibration, you should expect actually all your spins fully mixed with one third, one third and one third on each of the level, uh, levels. Okay, so above shining lasers, we can pump actually the spin from to the excited state phonon sideband. And for certain probability, it will direct decay back and emit a red photon. So in this case, for example, this is an example of a diamond samples in our lab where we have been irradiated them 
and generated a lot of nitrogen vacancy centers. So under white light, you can clearly see this diamond looks pink because the direct fluorescence is reddish in the red to like near infrared range. And however, note that this direct transition and decay actually does not change the spin, spin degree of freedom of the state. However, it turns out there is a special decay channels via a singlet levels, which actually sometimes when the spin state is plus one minus one, it will decay through the singlet channels and the spin state will go back to zero state. Therefore, actually after certain cycles of pumpings, for example, if you start with zero, you always end up in zero. But if you start with plus one minus one, you can sometimes go through this singlet decay and go back to zero state. Therefore, after several microsecond of laser pumping, one can actually prepare like more than 90% of a population onto the MS equals zero state. So this gives you a way to optically initialize the state. And at the same time, since this decay via the singlet channel actually does not emit a red photon and also has a much longer lifetime compared with to the other two decay uh, direct decay channels, therefore zero upon shining lasers, the zero state will give you more in principle, like more fluorescence than the MS equals plus one minus one state. In this case, you can actually use this to also probe or detect the spin state due to the different fluorescence levels. So this gives us a way to initialize and read out the spin state via optical pumping. Okay, so with this, we can actually also, once you can polarize it and read it out, you can also apply a coherent microwave to coherently manipulate the spin state uh, between the two levels. For example, this is a example of a Rabi oscillation between the two, for example, zero to the minus one, two spin levels, where with the different duration of the microwave pulse, you can see the fluorescence contrast actually coherently oscillate from a high level to a low level, which is corresponds to the state uh, manipulation from zero state to plus one minus one state. Okay, note that compared to other like AMO or quantum information system, a good thing for MV system is actually it can operate at a very wide range of environments ranging from, for example, milli Kelvin to 600, 700 Kelvin and from a like large environment from vacuum to, for example, tens of gigapascal pressure. Okay, so just one more slide on the MVs. Like in general, in a diamond, this typically MV is a nitrogen and a vacancy. So to create them, literally you just need to introduce nitrogen and vacancy into your system, right? So how to do this? We start with a diamond and typically we can have two different diamonds to start with. One is we already have the diamond that is doped with the nitrogens or we can do iron plantation to create a lot of nitrogens into the diamond as well. And after that, we can also do, for example, create vacancies via electron irradiation or ion plantation. After that, you can create also like some vacancies inside. And after that, you just need them to move around and forming MV centers. So in this case, we typically anneal them with a temperature larger than 800 C. And with that, the vacancies start to be mobile. And with certain probability, not very large, with certain small probability, you can have the, nit the vacancy to actually bond with the intrinsic nitrogen and form in an MV center. And yes. Without getting a bunch of. Yes, yes. So yeah, exactly. So this end up typically you get a M nitrogen to MV conversion around like five to 10%. So your question is if there is a way we can actually, for example, have in the MV center without that additional nitrogens. It's actually a really good question. I think in the past, what people are trying to do is for example, when you do this annealing, this is my understanding. I never tried this type of uh, experiment before, but once you actually form in some of the MV, you still have a lot of nitrogens there. So what you can do is, so the other vacancies actually after annealing, if they don't form with 
with a nitrogen, they may actually just be annealed and go out of the diamond. So after that, what you can do is you can irradiate it one more time to create more vacancies and just keep doing this annealing procedures. And it just takes time. But in principle, I think people have been seeing uh, a very high conversion rate on the order of like 20%. Now is, I think it's consistently achievable by doing this. I think they typically do annealing and irradiation at the same time rather than do this wrong, but they just anneal at the uh, keep doing implant uh, irradiation and then just keep annealing the diamond for maybe a few days or a few weeks to create this high MV, uh, MV nitrogen to MV conversion rate. And that so. I think five to 10% is generally this case. And note that this conversion rate cannot be more than 50% because it turns out, so this is a little bit, uh, I'm not supposed to think about discussing this, but since you asked this, so it turns out the MV we're reusing is actually the negatively charged MV centers. So which means it, it's not only an MV, it also needs to get an electron from the environment. But typically the sample is charge neutral. So you need an additional nitrogen nearby to donate the electron to your MV so you can form the MV minus you want. So therefore you have to, you cannot convert all the nitrogens to MVs. Otherwise you don't have the negative electron, the charge state anymore. So generally I think this can be as large as 50%. There were some papers reporting like 40%. 30%, but it's like, it's quite controversial at the moment, but I think 20% conversion rate, it's typically nowadays achievable. Yep. So in this case, as I mentioned, in, in what I am interested in is using this MV centers to either look at using a sensing purpose, where you're thinking about coupling, how do you do sensing? You're coupling this spins to the external environment. So to see how does the change of the external environment, for example, like magnetic field, temperature, electric field, start to affect the spin property of your MV centers. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on study the quantum dynamics, which we're not looking at spin coupled to environment anymore, but we're looking at the strong interactions that is within the spin themselves. Okay, so many body quantum dynamics. It turns out understanding actually a time dynamic, temporal dynamics of a strongly interacting quantum system is extremely hard. The reason is actually exactly motivated the, the development of quantum simulator and computer is that the, because the Hilbert space of a many body system grows exponentially with the system size, which makes it extremely hard to simulate on a classical computer. So in this case, when we're using the system to do a quantum, to, uh, using the MV system to simulate quantum dynamics, what we really mean is like we starting with some spin system with some controllability of the uh, microscopic Hamiltonian. And then as, since we can control this, we just let them time evolve and then trying to simulate what are like trying to under, like simulate the system under some specific many body Hamiltonian or quantum Hamiltonian govern the systems. And in the past with this uh, spin system, like I have been working on some, for example, we have been seeing some emergent uh, diffusion, be diffusive behavior, unconventional diffusive behavior. And we have been also using the system to probe like many body noise in the lower dimensions. And very recently, I think in just in my own lab, now we're starting to see some signatures of like a like a like a pre-thermalization behavior under uh, periodic driving systems, but so in this case, I'm going to mainly focus on the emergent hydrodynamics. And if I have time, I will probably use one or two more slides to discuss this lower dimension experiment. Great. So let me first give you guys an intuition: what does emergent hydrodynamics ever mean? So it turns out, given the quantum systems like a quantum, a many body quantum system or given a quantum Hamiltonian, typically it's very hard to solve, but uh, for a lot of the time, the late time dynamics of some conserved quantity, for example, you can think about energy if your Hamiltonian is a spin independent, or you can think about spin 
for uh, sorry, uh, energy if it's like a time independent Hamiltonian, or if you think can think about spin, degree of freedom, if you have a spin conserved Hamiltonian, typically this type of quantities may be governed by some classical description, like a classical hydrodynamic description at late times. For example, for the spin degree of freedom, like uh, you can think about diffusion, it's just a set of classical differential equations. This is, is this actually even surprising at all? I mean, for open quantum systems, you maybe think it's not surprising at all because your, your quantum system is actually coupled to some dissipative environment. With this environment, your quantum correlation quickly uh, deface, which leads to a classical transport behavior. However, here, when I'm really talking about this hydrodynamics behavior, we're thinking about for a closed quantum system where we don't couple to a dissipative environment. Will that ever happen actually here where maybe the many body dynamics could also lead to the emergent late time di uh, classical description? So let me give you one intuition of this. So if you start with a microscopic model and if you coarse grain your picture, maybe into some small subsystems, then for a certain subsystem here, for example, the rest of the many body system act effectively like a bath actually coupled to your small subsystems. In that case, it can also deface or effective giving you some effective defacing and in the macroscopic and lead to end up to a late time macroscopic description. However, as I mentioned, there is an enduring hard challenges because predicting this hydrodynamic properties, for example, like diffusivity, viscosity, compressibility, from starting from a microscopic quantum Hamiltonian is actually extremely hard because as I mentioned, the system size grows exponentially with the spin numbers. And even proving that it will happen for a generic many body system is actually extremely hard. So in this case, in our, we hope to actually tackle this from like a experimental perspective using our spin ensembles in diamond. In this case, let me first give you an intuition. What is the ingredients we need in our experimental platform if we want to study these behaviors? Okay, so the first thing is we need a conserved quantity, as I mentioned, because this is exactly the quantity we're going to look at. And in our spin system, this conserved quantity is exact just the spin number, the total spin numbers in projected on, for example, the Z directions. And then we need to also kick out the system from equilibration. So we need to make an inhomogeneous profile of our spin polarization. And then we need a way we can measure, for example, the, some local quantum, uh, some local properties so we can measure the quantum dynamics for example, we generate some spin polarization and then we just let the time evolve. And at the end, we measure, for example, the height or the width of the spin polarization uh, profile. And then we also need a way because we are looking at the late time emergent dynamics. We need a direct way to distinguish, for example, the local thermalization and the late time hydrodynamic behaviors. And as this is a quantum like as to study the dynamics, so ideally, you also need a way to engineer your microscopic Hamiltonian. For example, you want to have a knob to look at for change polarization profile, for example, change the interaction strength, and also change the disorder, for example, and see how does each of these microscopic uh, parameters starting to affect your uh, hydrodynamic uh, parameters. Okay. So now let me just give you this, like a very quick introduction to the experimental platform we're using, which is a coupled spins in diamond. So we're using actually a hybrid spin system, which consists of the red spins are the MV centers I just introduced to you guys. And the blue spins are actually just the dark spins, which is actually we discussed before, it's just the intrinsic nitrogen spins. And it turns out, I think we were actually, thanks for Elizabeth's question. So we actually, as I mentioned, we only can convert a small portion of the nitrogen to the MV centers. So therefore, typically in this system, you can think about, you have a very strongly interacting nitrogen spin bath, or this is what we call a P1 center, 
which is a spin one half degree of freedom. And then we also have a dilute ensembles like 0.5 to one part per million of this NV centers, which acting as a local controllable local quantum probe to study the dynamics of the P1 centers. Yes. So that number PPM is similar to the rate of carbon 13 is smaller. Uh, so carbon 13 is 10 to the 4. So it's like 1%. But note that uh, for nuclear spin, because like if you think about nuclear spin coupled to MV center or electronic spin, because the geomagnetic ratio is smaller by, for example, like three orders to four orders smaller. So typically, the in this case, the yeah, the nuclear spin to MV or to PY interaction is still much much weaker than the yeah. That's an electronic spin. You're right. So they are the nitrogen substitution, and think about just simple nitrogen have one more electron compared with the native carbon. So they end up actually just hosting a free electronic spins. Yes. And so it turns out before like MV center, it's as I mentioned, it's a spin one degree of freedom. You can optically polarize it and like just read them out. But for this P1 centers, they are dark spins typically, like they don't react to laser. You cannot polarize or read them out. So in this case, Actually, for most of the experiments, people treat them as a dark spin bath that decohere your MVs, and which people don't want them. But in our case, we want to use we want to use the fact they are very high density, so you can have on average, for example, three nanometers between the spins, which will leading to a strong dipolar interactions between the spins. So we want to use them as our resources. So note that one more thing I want to emphasize is creating the spins very randomly. So this will lead to a large positional disorder into the system where each spin, it's not on a regular lattice, but there are just have a random positions and random distance between the spins. Okay. So let's first think about what is the dynamics or the, the quantum dynamics or Hamiltonian driven by between this yellow spins or the P1 spins. They're driven by the long range dipolar interactions typically have a very many, many terms. However, in the limit, if we have the zero, like the splitting between spin down and spin up to be much larger than the dipolar interaction strength, which is typically true by applying some moderate magnetic field. In this case, we can work in the rotating frame and only keep all the energy conserving terms, which end up to be a J over R cube, a long range term, some angular dependence uh, dependence parameters. And then you have the S plus, S minus, plus, S minus, S plus, which is just the spin flip-flop between the two spins. And then you also have the SZ, SZ, which is the icing interaction between the spins. Okay, so note that this Hamiltonian now conserve the total spin SZ, right? So this is exactly the ingredient one, we need to conserve the total spin excitation for to govern this, this many body dynamics. Yes. So yeah, I'm actually going to talk about this here, but typically we're working around like 500 gauss in, a, in some special uh, uh, resonance. So the second gradient I'm talking, going to introduce is the prepare of this. We need to have a way to prepare the inhomogeneous spin polarization profile. And it turns out the, as I mentioned, the P1 centers are dark spins, so you cannot use laser to directly polarize them. So in order to do this, we are actually using the MV as a polarization sinks or sink or a polarization source to polarize the P1 centers. For example, we can actually polarize in the normal geometry, we'll polarize the MV and we can measure how long does it take for the MV to depolarize or go back to equilibration. That's a T1 type of measurement. And in this case, in a, in a like a generic magnetic field, typically we polarize the MV as zero state and the MV zero to minus one transition is not resonant with a P1, for example, spin down to spin up transition. In this case, the MV spin polarization is not directly coupled to the P1s via flip-flop. So in this case, we can measure a very, very long lived coherence, even uh, like lifetime, even at room temperature, which is typically limited by the phonon where MV given the 
given the spin polarization to the phonon degree of freedom inside the diamond. And it typically is like few milliseconds long at room temperature and can be extended to like hundreds of milliseconds at low temperatures. However, if in order we can bring the NV to be actually resonant with the P1s with some very special magnetic field around 510 Gauss, where now the NV center is zero to minus one transition is resonant with the spin down to spin up transitions of the P1 centers. In this case, you can think about once you polarize your NV center up, now they can have direct flip-flop, which can flip up, like can make your NV to be down and the P1 center gets flipped up. Right? In this case, a direct evidence is if you look at the NV depolarization, it will, once you polarize the NV, you will have a very fast decay, which is coming from this direct flip, direct flip flop with the, with the nearby P1 centers. And we typically see a more than two orders of magnitude decrease in the T1 time of the NV centers. However, this actually also just gives you a way to polarize the nearby P1 centers. Because you're in, think about this geometry, like your NV is dealing with all the P1 centers nearby, a few hundreds of them. And every time you shine your laser, you polarize your NV, it can flip flop, for example, with the nearby P1 centers, flip it to up. And then your laser, if you repolarize your NV centers, it can now keep flip flop with another P1s and then flip flop with a third P1 until you polarize the P1s nearby your NV centers. So this gives us a way to direct, like to, to directly prepare some inhomogeneous spin polarization of the NV centers, uh, sorry, of the P1 centers. Yes. Yeah, sorry, you mean here, right? Uh, sorry. Yeah, here, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So, so for zero to plus one, it's not allowed because the zero to plus one transition is far detuned from the. Okay. From, oh, is there a magnet field? You can. I don't think so. To be honest, the reason is NV has a zero field splitting. So once you start to apply a B field, the plus one go up, minus one go down. Yes, and for P one, it's always going up. So it's like. I think the splitting between P1 and zero to plus one of NV is always maintain the same value, which is the NV's real field splitting. Yes. Yep. So you mean this splitting, right? So generally, if you don't consider the nuclear spin of the P1s, which typically is very large, the hyperfine interaction, uh, it generally it's all coming from dipolar interactions between the P1s. That's like typically on the order, yeah, of like few megahertz, yeah, and that's the interaction we're using now. Yeah. Yeah. So we were thinking about that as well, but we think since everything is all governed by dipolar interactions, and it's that's also the same source of the homogeneous browning, so we think that typically is not. No surprise. Yeah. No. Yes. Yes. Good. So, yeah. So in this case, we have a way to actually polarize the P1 center, uh, the P1 centers near one of the NV centers. And then note that there is also now we have a one of the knob where we can tune the polarization with by just how long, by just control how long we pump the NV centers. Okay, so this is the one of the knob. And the third ingredient is how do we probe the local P1 centers? As I mentioned, the P1 center is not directly reacting to lasers. So in this case, actually what we do is again, we're using the depolarization dynamics uh, and this actually acting as like, so think about this. If I'm starting to polarize the nearby P1 centers, in that case, then my NV cannot flip flop with the nearby P1 centers anymore because they are all polarized, right? In this case, I should expect by more and more NV centers we polarize. Oh, uh, is there a zoom? Sorry, sorry. Oh, I see, I see. I just want to make sure there's no question from the zoom. 
Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah, sorry, Chris. Just want to repeat one more time is I think uh, Professor Elizabeth is asking about like if there is a if there is a frozen core effect where uh, the near, near near the MV centers, the P1 centers will be, the energy level will be strongly shifted, so they're not resonant anymore. But it turns out all the source, like the homogeneous broadening here, is coming from the direct dipole interactions. So overall, in this case, there is no such uh, significant shift or the frozen core effect of the P1 centers. Yep. And so okay. So now. You're welcome. So now let's think about the probe in the local P1 dynamics. As I mentioned, if we polarize more and more P1 centers near your MV, then your P MV centers cannot flip flop with the nearby P1 anymore. So what you're going to expect is actually with longer and longer pumping lasers, you should expect the yes, the P the actually the MV lifetime become longer and longer with your longer pumping durations. This is indeed actually observed by the data where by pumping longer and longer, we see the lifetime of the MV center can be extended by a significant amount of time, which indicating like we're literally polarizing the nearby P1 centers. However, in order to study the emergent hydrodynamics, the fourth ingredient we want is how do we distinguish the local thermalization and the late time emergent dynamics? Where is the time we want to cut here and to look at the late time dynamics? So in this case, we are using actually the a Chauvin technique where we start to actually use the highly of resonant plus one state to isolate the to isolate the non-universal early time dynamics from the late time universal behavior. So what we do this is quite simple. So after we polarize the nearby P1 centers, we can pump the MV to the plus one state with another microwave and now making it far off resonant with all the P1 centers. In this case, we let it time evolve for some time tau D. Now the P1 centers start to diffuse, the polarization profile start to diffuse out. And then at some point we can pump the MV center back and in this case, now we have a polarization, a delta function polarization bubbles on top of like a, like a polarization profile. So the expectation now will be if you have actually a very fast relaxation. So if you look at only measure the MV, you're going to expect a fast relaxation followed by a slow hydrodynamic micro, uh, hydro, hydrodynamics behavior. And it turns out this expectation is indeed burned out by the data. So by changing the tau D, which is that wait time, we can clearly see actually a fast initial local depolarization followed by a late time dynamics that lying on top of each other, which is independent of the time, the diffusion time we let it evolve. And this late time dynamics will collapse of all different tau, and this identifies the late time actually hydrodynamic behavior or the, the region. I want to make sure how many times. Good. So before we're thinking about how to actually think about the, the, the profile of this late time dynamics, let's just quickly review what we're going to expect from conventional diffusion. So from conventional diffusion governed by this diffusion equation, where with this PTR is the density of a conserved quantity, for example, the spin polarization, in this case, if we have a spin diffusion coefficient D, what we can expect is at time equals zero, you prepare, for example, some, some arbitrary function like a profile here, and then you let it time evolve. Under this diffusion equation, conventional wisdom always tell you it will quickly approach us to a Gaussian profile. And in order to characterize the diffusive behavior, you can have two complementary ways. One is you can look at the height of the polarization bubble uh, profile, which we call the survival probability. And this will goes with time to the D over two power law, where D is the dimensionality of the system. In this case, should be three in our systems. And at the same time, there's a complementary way to diagnose diffusion, which is looking at the mean squared displacement of this polarization profile, which should scales linear with time T 
where the small like the dimensionality and with the slope which is the two dimensionality multiplied by diffusion coefficient so as i mentioned our mv price our mv is literally looking like as a probe of the height or the survival probability of the prioritization profile so we're going to look at the first actually criterion of the diffusive behavior and indeed if we look log the y-axis and log also the x-axis we indeed can see like a power log here will be like a straight line into the system and we have been seeing indeed the grace with the diffusive behavior it goes with t to the minus three halves where three is the dimensionality of the system okay and with this we can also extract some diffusion coefficient around like 0.35 nanometer square per microsecond. Okay, this is inevitably demonstrate the diffusive behavior of our dynamics. And we can now try to also build up like a semi-classical description of this behavior. It turns out if you just isolate the two spins out, you can there literally have the dipolar interaction, you have the resonant flip-flop and also on-site random fields which is generate our icing field. And the icing field effectively just generates some local random magnet fields that slightly shifted two of your P1 centers. So in this case, we can actually semi-classically, we can use a Fermi's golden rule uh, estimation to approximate the spin flip-flop rate with like a J square. So now it goes with one over our cube square multiplied by two gamma divided by gamma square plus delta square, where delta is the, is the uh, icing interaction strength that actually make your transition slightly off resonant. And the small gamma is a T2 decoherence time of the MV centers. And this effectively give you a one over R cube interaction. And note that actually one of our cube spin deprivation, uh, spin flip-flop rate, and note that all these parameters inside can be independently characterized. For example, your distance, we can independently characterize by measuring the density or the spin interaction strength. And we can also measure the gamma by looking at the coherence time of the MV and the delta by measure the line width of the MV centers. In this case, we can actually now, this will lead to a simple semi-classical description, like a set of differential equations. And using our model, it turns out we can actually fit very well to the experimental data, which justify like our model actually works very well. And note that I want to emphasize again, there's no free parameters in our model because all the parameters there is what we can independently verify. And with this, we can also extract a diffusion coefficient around like 0.37 nanometer square, which agrees very well per microsecond, which agrees very well with the experimental measured one. And at the same time, as I mentioned, there is a complementary way we can look at the diffusion, which is looking at the mean square displacement. And our model gives us a way to look at the spatial profile of this. And if we look at that, somehow we extract a very large diffusion coefficient, which is almost like three times larger than the diffusion coefficient we extract from the survival probability. So this actually at the same time starting to actually, uh, yeah, bugs us a lot. And then, but with our model, we actually can also look at the spatial profile of the spin prioritization. And it turns out it's not a Gaussian, but it's a long-lived, quite close to exponential profile, a long-lived exponential profile. This now starts to let us think about why this kind of diffusive behavior doesn't lead you to, an, to a, like a Gaussian profile, but will give you a long-lived exponential profile. So in this case, let's go back to the assumption underlying conventional diffusion. So in the diffusive equation, now if you write it in the Fourier space, in the K space, we can expand all the terms like this. So there are a few remarks. First, there is no zeroth order term, which means there is a conservation of total polarization, right? There's no like zeroth order term. And there's only K dependence because there is translation invariance. And there's also only even terms of K, which means the locality in the microscopic details. However, it turns out our system strongly violates the last two. 
the existence of positional disorder, also the on-site random disorder, actually will strongly violate the translation environs. And the existence of the long-range interactions will also violate the locality in the microscopic details of the system. So let's start to investigate them one by one. So the dynamic modification, which is the disorder we're thinking about, which is a combination of positional and on-site field, just means like there will be actually, depending on the location of your P1 centers, there will be all different kinds of like local diffusivities or a local diffusion constant. So you need to actually average across for a long time to have them all average out, have the spin polarization bubbles to uh, like expand to all different configurations of the spins, then you can have an average local diffusion coefficient, right? So this is exactly the, the intuition here. And it turns out we proved that this can be captured by a simple dynamical modification, which now has this term, which has a time dependence partial T into the diffusion equation. And with this term in, included here, we can actually predict a Yukawa type of potential, uh, like polarization profile, even like at late times. So there will be a long lived non Gaussian profile that is very long lived which is actually exactly the reason why in our experiment and models, like the two diffusion coefficient doesn't match very well. And for the long range interaction, let me give you another intuition. So for long range power law hoppings, they will adding additional static modification to the diffusion equation with a power K alpha minus D, which alpha is the long range hopping and D is the dimensionality of the system. And if, alpha minus D is much smaller than two. It's an ultra long range system where this term now dominates the K square term. The system is not diffusive anymore. You're going to go into the, like the Lavi flight or long range hopping region. And if you're actually in the super, like not too long range, too long range in, uh, region where alpha minus four D larger than four, then this term is even smaller than the second order, uh, like the, the sec higher order corrections. In this case, diffusive diffusion is almost not modified. And however, it turns out there is an intermediate region where now your alpha minus D is like larger than two, but smaller than four. This case, the long range interactions will actually lead to a small correction uh, to the approach of the, of the diffusive behavior, which is exactly where in our system, our, our long range, uh, our alpha is around, now it's J square, so it's around six. So six minus D is three, which is exactly where our experimental lies. However, very unfortunate, we have, sim we have some simulation like including this long range interactions, somehow you can actually see a different approach. So the, in, the inset here is the pure dynamics. You can see at late time, it's a T to the minus three half, but including or not including the long range part will lead to a different approach to this T to the minus three halves uh, behavior. But however, in our experiment, we cannot see like any strong evidence supporting the existence of this long range interactions. So there's no, no conclusive evidence from the data, which we believe because the system now is dominated by disorder, which actually hide the long range correction. It should be there, but it was hidden maybe by the disorder effect. So the last thing I was mentioned on this is like, we also have an independent way to engineer the Hamiltonian. So by actually, by using the hyperfine interaction of the NVN, uh, the P1 centers. Here, I'm not going to go to details, but we have a way to actually engineer the interactions where we can see the diffusion co coefficient is now actually keep increasing with increasing interaction strength. And we can also drive some of the bad spins away. So we have a way to tune the on-site disorder of the system. And we can actually also see by decreasing the disorder of the system, we have an increase in like diffusion coefficient. So I think that's the story of this long uh, emergent hydrodynamics. Yes. You mean like a
Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That's actually an interesting thought. So in our case, we definitely haven't tried that, but I think that's quite interesting. Yeah, I think that's probably possible, but just like, but you cannot turn off that field very fast, right? You have to like turn off that field, like, yeah, it's a microwave. So yeah, sorry, the, the sorry, 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 Chris. Yeah, yeah, the question is if like, uh, from Bryce's, if we can actually apply a transverse field to actually engineer the Hamiltonian and also prepare adiabatically. Pre yeah, like an ion, I think, yes, yes. To like engineer the Hamiltonian or like prepare the system. I think that's a very good point. We never thought about that or we never tried that, but I think that's, we can discuss that further. I, I mean, that, that sounds like an interesting idea as well. Yes, thanks. So yeah, okay. Lastly, I'm going to just use one slide to talk about some of the things we're having recently working on like uh, in the dipolar spins in 2D. So it turns out, as I mentioned already before, like dimensionality and long range interaction power, actually the interplay between them will lead to some different behavior of the quantum dynamics. And in most of the NV experiment or the solid state experiment, we're living in a 3D geometry. So very recently in, in a collaboration with like uh, Anya Yaich's group at Santa, UC Santa Barbara, we're able to now actually can create a very thin layer of diamonds that is been doped with nitrogen and NV centers. How they do this is you start with a very pure diamond, you start to grow very slowly. And at some point you turn on the nitrogen gas and you can dope a very thin layer of diamonds with a thickness around like five nanometer to containing defect centers. Note that the spin-spin spacing between this P1 centers is also on the order of three to five nanometers. So in this case, as long as the thickness is on the same order, we effectively can create a quasi two dimensional system. And then we can actually reduce the dimensionality from three to two in this case, but at the same time maintain the long range power law uh, dipolar interaction to be one over R cubed. So very recently we have been trying to characterize to see if somehow we, this is, been proposed or been demonstrated this growth by a, for a long time, but very recently, we're trying to understand if somehow from the spin dynamics perspective, if one can actually, if the spins knows that I'm living in a 2D, 2D path rather than a 3D world. It turns out there is actually one way you can figure it out. That is literally by looking at the decoherence of the MV center that coupled to the P1 centers we actually theoretically pre predict that the decoherence of the profile will scales with exponential to the T over T2 to some power, which is di dimensionality D divided by the long range power alpha. And in 3D, it's three over three. So you typically see this is the orange data where you see this is a single exponential decay of the de uh, prioritization profile. And here, the, the large picture is we log the coherence. So we do a log. So we take this E out and we look at this power law. And then we log log the data. So the power law will become like a line in this plot. So this is a way we can see if our prediction is robust. It turns out the orange data agrees very well with like the power one. And then in the 2D samples we recently fabricated, we can clearly see a significant different profile where you have a much slower decay at late time. And if we do the same behavior here, we can see the initial decay actually agrees with the two, uh, two over three or two thirds power law, which agrees with dimensionality equals two and alpha equals three. And there is, turns out there's an interesting actually approach to the one third power law at late time, which we think it's coming from the fact actually now the my bath spin, the P1 centers, like 
they also have a correlation time of their own polarization, which is literally coming from the flip-flop between the P1 centers. And once you reach this correlation time of the P1 centers, your approach to some random walk region, which goes to one third of the power law. It turns out in 3D, there should be also the same behavior, but typically in 3D, it's like a power law one decay, stretch power one decay. So it's actually will, I think here is already the noise region. So we don't think, we probably typically don't see them in the 3D region because the single exponential decay is too fast at late time than the normal, than the stretch exponential decay. And with this characterization, we're now quite confident, like we're now leaving really create a, ensembles of spins in 2D and then we're now trying to use them to explore some novel dynamics at lower dimensions. Okay, I think last, just, just to summarize, I'm also interested in, for example, some quantum sensing experiment at extreme conditions. And it turns out pressure has recently been demonstrated as a super powerful tool to, uh, to like tune the dynamics of like materials as a tuning knob. And, Typically, when you apply high pressure, you use this type of diamond anvil cell systems. You squeeze two diamond, the hardest materials in the world, and you can extreme, generate extremely high pressures. And it turns out recently, we have been trying to develop an NV centers near the tip of one of the culet, uh, tip of the diamond and using them as a local sensors for high pressure physics. And it has been demonstrated as a very powerful tool that is already uh, have a much better spatial resolution compared with conventional methods. And very recently, we're uh, now recently, my group is, has been also working on some novel defect centers in 2D materials as quantum sensors. The motivation is actually for, if you want to use MV centers as sensors, you want them to be as close as possible to the surface, right? Because in that case, you can put other things on top of the diamond surface so they're closer. However, it turns out diamond is a 3D lattice. So if you have the, like, if you go up to the surface, you need have to terminate all the carbon bonds, which will lead to a lot of dirty dangling bonds on top of the diamond surface. And this dangling bonds can hold some free electron spins on top of the surface, which give you some magnetic noise or decoherence or charge noise. And therefore people have been working so hard to like make the diamond surface as clean as possible. And, but this still, like if you make the MV center very close to the surface, the coherence time of the MV centers is becoming shorter and shorter. So now recently, actually, why not we, if like another alternative is like, why not we make the defects directly living in a 2D world or in a 2D materials? You know, layered materials so that they don't need to worry about the surface termination. And it turns out this has been recently discovered like two years ago on the spin defect in hexagonal boron nitrite. And this is a boron vacancy defect, which has the property very like MV centers. And my group have been recently collaborating with uh, Tong Tang Li's group at Purdue and also Chung Hui Dai from Alex Zato's group at Berkeley. We're trying to actually also explore, for example, this is a image of this HBN flakes and we can create those defects inside and we can also see the electron spin resonance as well as the Rabi oscillation of this kind of boron vacancy defect HBN. And we're hoping to explore them and trying to use them as a new quantum sensors that lives in 2D. Yep, I think that's everything. I want to thank all my collaborators and now I have my own team at uh, Washington University. And yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.